All right, test, test, test. Well, hello, everybody. My name's Jeff Pearson. I'm the pastor of a local church called The Bridge in Stevensville, Maryland, and we have come to your state capital as a part of God's plan, we pray, to introduce you to him and his peace. And this is our official kickoff to the 2014 Peace Rally here in Montpelier. We pray that you will come to see and know the truth and the love of Jesus the Christ in a way that is truly, literally, eternally transforming. And I'd like to open up with a word of prayer, and I tell you where we're going to go this morning, or this afternoon, is we're going to take a look in about half an hour at a quick overview of what God's Word says about peace, literally from beginning to end. So with that said, would you start off by bowing your heads with me and praying to the one true King? Father, I come to you now and I thank you so much for your truth. I thank you, Lord, that we can come on a beautiful day like this and that we've been given opportunity to share your love and your light. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will become greater and I slash we will become less and that you will do a miraculous work that leads to more lives on mission, all for your glory and only and always by your grace. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, I want to share with you a message that I've entitled, The Evolution of Peace. The Evolution of Peace. And to do that, I want to begin by addressing some things that get a little confusing in the real world. Now, as a pastor, one would not expect me to put words like evolution and biblical peace together. The truth of the matter is there's a tremendous amount of contention and argument in today's world about the role and the reality of evolution, and especially through the culture of the church. And so I'd like to take that on head on by beginning with giving us a shared understanding of the definitions that we're looking at. Let's talk for a second about evolution. And just so you know, I'm not bringing this to you from a Baptist preacher's perspective. Let me share with you what Webster's Dictionary says in defining evolution. The first definition is simply this. Evolution, it's a noun. It's a process of formation or growth. It is development. Evolution, in its true factual sense, is a process of growth and or development. Now, Webster gives us a second set of definitions, but note carefully what's in this definition. Number two, evolution is a theory that all existing organisms developed from earlier forms by natural selection. It's a theory. Now, most would say, yeah, I get that. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. To understand evolution is to understand it's a theory. So what's a theory? Well, Webster's gives us some insight. A theory is an explanation whose status is still conjectural. So a theory is an explanation that is still conjectural. Say, okay, where does that take us? Well, let's see what Webster says about conjectural. Conjectural means it is the formation of an opinion without sufficient evidence. So we're looking now at a theory that is nothing more than an unfounded opinion without sufficient evidence. Well, what's sufficient? Sufficient means, according to Webster, adequate for purpose, enough. That means that there is not enough evidence to support the opinion, which is in fact unfounded. In short, what we have in the cultural sense of evolution is a fallacy. The fact of evolution is evolution is a development. It is a formation and growth. The fallacy of evolution is that something comes from nothing. That's crazy. So let's take a look at the evolution of peace through its factual filters. And in order to do that, I want to take you to God's word. 
And I pray that you'll be blessed to see that you don't have to rely on the fallacies of this world, that you can stand by faith on the facts of God and his word. And he speaks very directly to peace, peace that I pray you long for openly and acknowledge your need for, because if we're honest, every one of us has got something going on inside that only the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth can address and resolve. So I would like to look at peace literally from cover to cover from our Bible, going from the very beginning of the Bible in the first verse of Genesis all the way to the last verse of the Bible at the close of the book of Revelation. And in doing that, I want to use a short acronym, PEACE. P-E-A-C-E. And we will literally cover, in a gross oversimplification, cover to cover the full span of the Bible so that you can see God has always had a peace plan. He has had a peace plan from before time began. This PEACE acronym, you and I will see that the P stands for perfection. God said, in the beginning, God created. He created pure perfection in the context of peace, and it was the personification of peace. P is for perfection. The E in peace is for evil. You might say, well, we don't have peace now, so what happened? What happened? Evil happened, and we'll see this in God's word. The A in our acronym stands for again, and again, and again. For you will see as we look at the Old Testament that it's kind of like Groundhog Day. God brings us perfection, we break it. God blesses us in a way that brings us peace, we get fat and happy, we take him for granted, we sin, crash and burn, and eventually cry out for grace and mercy. He relents, gives it to us, and we go through it again. We'll look at that briefly. The C for our peace acronym stands for Christ and Christianity. You'll see as he comes into what we know as the New Testament, we'll look briefly at the Gospels, the book of Acts, and the letters, the epistles, whereby we now come to a place of being able to say, ah, now I see Christ arrives and we say, now I see. And we end our acronym with the letter E for the eternal. And we can look back from the book of Revelation at the very end and we can see once again that God's peace plan was from before time began and it will finish out on the other side of eternity without end. So with that said, let me just walk with you through God's word, looking first at perfection. Again, God's word says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created. We also see in John 1.1 that in the beginning the word was with God and the word was God. I want you to recognize that Jesus the Christ is the creator of peace. That in the beginning God created. Not only do we have a creator of peace, but at the very beginning of the Bible we see that peace was created in the garden that we were in the context of peace. So not only did we have a creator of peace, but creation was made in peace. That was God's plan. He did this. We also know that in the beginning, it was good. God's word said it was not only good, it was very good. Right out of the gate, God said, let me show you my plan. And unfortunately, we didn't get to see that come to fruition without Satan and sin entering the stage. And so we go from this perfection in the very beginning to the onslaught of sin. You and I, friends, if you know anything, you know that you're not perfect. Every one of us can acknowledge that. And if you ever wondered why, why aren't I perfect? It's because you were born a sinner. I was born a sinner. Sin came into the world and the perfection and the peace was broken in the garden. And we see this. Evil enters in Genesis 3.1. We're not out of the garden of Eden before sin enters. And know this, the, the seeds of doubt are what spread the weeds of worry and sin. The devil comes onto the stage in the garden of Eden and the first things we see to break peace is a question. Did God really say if you know what it is to doubt the goodness and the truth and the love of God, know this, that you're in good company. 
Every living human being has come through this bloodline where sin has so stained our humanity that you cannot get away from the reality of evil. If you want to know why you don't know perfect peace, it's because you're a sinner, that there is sin in this fallen world. That's the truth. Now, you'll see before we're done that that doesn't need to leave you in that place. Praise God, we've got one who championed peace. You see, peace was corrupted in the garden, but peace was also championed in the garden. No further than verse 15 of that same chapter in Genesis do we see the championing of peace coming out. As God promises us, after Satan has brought sin into the world through Adam and Eve, God makes a promise. The first evidence of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is in Genesis 3.15, where he says, Okay, Satan, you have corrupted the peace and the perfection of the garden through sin. But know this, while you will nip at humanity's heel to include Jesus the Christ, there will come a time where he will crush your head. And we saw, even still in the Garden of Eden, that peace would be championed and that evil would not prevail. And I offer that to you as hope and encouragement today. You and I may not know the fulfillment of this peace even on this planet, but know this, that God has made a promise that if you will come to know his son, Jesus the Christ, as Lord and Savior, if his miraculous work of grace will come into your heart, and I encourage you to cry out for that, then he, the Messiah, will not only rescue you eternally, but he will bring himself, his peace, himself, into you. And you will become a living, breathing ambassador of him. And one of the things that we are promised is that you can and will walk through this life, this evil fallen world, with the promise of his peace ever present with you all the time, any day and every day. Friends, I also want to encourage you to think about the A in our acronym again and again and again. And if you were to leave the book of Genesis and you were to go and look at the rest of what we know as the Old Testament from the books of Exodus through Malachi, what you'll see is this series of events. It really reminds me of Groundhog Day. Have you been there where it just seems like it happens over and over and over again? You see, God came and he communicated his peace through miracles and through messages. He demonstrated over and over and over again that he was the God of creation and that he could bring anything that he wanted to bear. He brought the Israelites across the Red Sea by parting the water. He demonstrated over and over and over again his miraculous power to say to you and to me, have faith, trust me. Peace is to be found in relationship with me. He not only showed this through miracles, but he did it through his messages. He, he sent people of God that we would call prophets, those that would speak on his behalf. Isaiah would tell those folks that Christ was coming. Jeremiah would say over and over again, thus says the Lord, listen and obey. Hosea would remind us that none of us are worthy. Ezekiel would say to you and I that are Christians, you are going to be watchmen on a wall, that you have a responsibility. Friends, over and over and over again, we watched these people of God go on this roller coaster ride of being blessed by God. And, and I just want to say to you here today, no matter what your opinion is of Christ or Christianity, you have been blessed to, to know that you could hear this truth, to have the knock on the eternal door of your heart happen right here, right now. That's a demonstration of God's love and his grace. So if you said to me, you don't understand how tough it is. You don't know what I've been through. I may not. And I don't mean to shrink or to make light of any struggle that you or anybody has. But I'm here to tell you that he's able to overcome and to bring you through whatever you may have struggled. And this is in large part the message of the Old Testament when we see God again and again and again showing up. Now he'll bring not just mercy and grace. Sometimes he'll bring discipline and wrath. And that's part of the warning. You see, love not only invites and encourages, love warns. And times love fights. But I want you to recognize that as you read the Bible, the same perfection, the same promises from the beginning that were broken 
through sin and Satan were addressed through miracles and through the message over and over and over again. And I have no doubt that if you're here today, just the fact that you are in our Western culture and civilization, at the very least, I trust that you know somebody who knows Jesus. You have heard at least rumors of the truth, enough so that you'll never be able to stand before a holy and righteous God and say, no, I don't get it. I, uh, I had no idea. You see, another part of the Bible tells us that God has written enough of his truth on the heart of every person that there'll be no excuse on Judgment Day. The best we'll be able to do is say, oh yeah, we were like those knuckleheads that kept going through Groundhog Day over and over and over and over again. Friends, I pray that this will be the day, this will be the time, that the truth and the love of Jesus Christ and his peace and his power will come to you in a miraculous way. That brings us to the C of the acronym of peace, which is Christ. And Christ also replicated in what we know as the church or Christianity. And, and I just bring this to you again, showing what happens in what we know as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four parts of the Bible that tell us about the life and the ministry directly of Jesus. Then the book of Acts, where we see the church of Christ born. And then the letters, or what we call the epistles, where Christ and his ministry is further explained. I'll tell you this, that in the opening part of the New Testament, we see Christ coming, we see Christ crowned, and we see Christ crucified. We see the promise fulfilled that the Prince of Peace does come, the Messiah comes, born of a virgin in a way that fulfills so much prophecy that it's really statistically undeniable that he is who he says he is. We see him crowned as the Prince of Peace, Sadly, with a crown of thorns, but a crown nonetheless, he is king. And ultimately, we see him crucified. Christ is crucified. And we see that, too, to be the fulfillment of the promise that will empower the peace to come. He said when he was crucified, it is finished. What died on that day was death, eternal. He said for every person that would come to know him, the Prince of Peace, and have his peace, not just the absence of stress and strife, not a feeling, but the presence of the person of Jesus the Christ in you as a believer. He said for you, it is finished. That the work that I've done on the cross has killed death forever. And as a side note, friends, if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, Know this, that can't died on the cross as well. There is no longer any excuse for those that are in Christ Jesus. Second Peter 1.3 tells us, For you have received everything you need for life and godliness. So in the Gospels, we see Christ come, we see him crowned, and we see him crucified. When we get to the book of Acts, we see the church. We see the church born. We know that we know that we know that we are the people of God when we are indwelt by his spirit and we know amongst other things the power and the presence of his peace. We see in Acts chapter 2 in particular the birth of this church, the birth of what we know today as Christianity. Now I will tell you that unfortunately not all that call themselves church or not all that call themselves Christian are in fact church or Christian and we see this in large part through the addressing of the crowd, the crowds that we see in the New Testament. You see, we're told over and over and over again that there will be many who come and they deceive. There will be many false prophets. Jesus himself referred to these as wolves, those that would intentionally lead you astray. Those that would say, oh, I'll tell you about the peace of God. Oh, I'll tell you about the Prince of Peace. I'll tell you about all the particulars that you need. And then they intentionally lead people astray. And I have to tell you, as one that has come from Maryland, we have many wolves where I live. We have many wolves where I live. And I say to you here locally, you have many wolves here. We looked at a passage this morning that reminded us that Jesus sent his disciples out as sheep amongst wolves. We're here today. Our peace plan, you won't find any signs. We're not looking to argue with anybody. We're not anti-anything. We are pro-Jesus. We are here as ambassadors of the Christ. We offer nothing but truth and love. 
We compromise nothing. But we're not here as antagonists. My prayer is that through the sharing of the truth and love of Christ, a presence of the real church, that some of you will hear him knocking at the door of your heart. And for the first time, you'll hear the voice of peace beckoning you to come. My prayer is that some of us here today, or perhaps watching with us online, perhaps this will be the day that the Prince of Peace comes and you surrender to victory and say, yes, Lord. Know that this is the call. This is the beckoning. So we know that peace was perfected in the beginning. We know it was evil that corrupted it. We know that again and again and again, sinners both in old times and in present have a tendency to take God for granted, to ignore his truth. Sadly, in doing so, to walk away from the only promise of peace that will ever be made, at least the only one with any substance. We saw that in the opening of the New Testament, that both in Christ and in Christianity, we see first the person of peace in the promise of Christ, and then the people of peace in the church, the true church. The Bible talks about the children of Abraham being God's people, God's children. Unfortunately, today, there are many that would hold that physical bloodline that don't hold it spiritually. And we're blessed, those that know Christ as king, those that have been radically transformed, not by works, not by religion, not by church attendance, but by the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. We know the privilege that it is to be his children in his church. Lastly, in our acronym of peace, recognizing that it was perfected in the beginning. It was corrupted through evil. His people and the people of all history have gone through a Groundhog Day process. And then we saw Christ come and the birth of his church and the call to the Christian community to be his people. Well, lastly, friends, if you read through the Bible and you get to the end, you'll find the book of Revelation. And I'll tell you this, that if you were to look at that book and look at it in three ways, first, you would see that peace is very compelling at the beginning of the book of Revelation. We're called to and beckoned to come and heed the warning, embrace the grace to truly repent and relent of our sin. I'm particularly fond of the second and third chapter of Revelation where you see Jesus speaking to seven different churches and giving us kind of a scale of what happens when you lose your love for Christ. Let me tell you what happens is not pretty. Peace amongst other things are lost. And in that passage alone, Jesus speaks to some churches that aren't even churches anymore. And I have to tell you, I walk through your community and I see churches that aren't even churches anymore. And lest you think I'm pointing fingers, I can do the same thing in my community. There are churches that aren't even churches anymore. Christ compels us to come to the place of truth and love, to know his peace. In Revelation, in the middle chapters from ver uh, chapter 4 through 11, you see the warning and the foretelling of what will happen in the birth pains of his coming back. And I tell you this, in Revelation 11, verse 17, we see the promise and the foretelling of the prophecy that at that point... Jesus comes back and begins to reign. And know this, that not only is peace compelling, but peace is coming back. Peace is coming back. Jesus is on his way. Every day, we're one day closer. Every minute, we're one minute closer. Every second, we are one second closer to peace returning. And I have to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? You see, there'll be no do-overs in that twinkling of an eye. In that moment, if you're not ready, it will be too late. And so I come not only compelled, but I urge you. I urge you to cry out to Jesus. If, you, if this does not make sense, find one of my friends that are in these shirts and say, I want to just say, it didn't make sense. Help me. And I promise you we will. I promise you we will help. I promise you we will pray. I promise you that we will do everything we can to help you come to that place. Now, we can't make it happen. In reality, neither can you. 
This is an act of grace, but what we can do is we can pray and we can cry out and we can ask Jesus to do what only he can do. Friends, knowing that gets you ready for the very end of the Bible. As we look at peace, not only does the beginning of Revelation compel us, not only does the middle of Revelation assure us that peace is coming back, but when we get to the end of the Bible, literally the last words, we're assured that peace will be completed that Jesus in his return will set everything right going into eternity. There will be no more ambiguity. There will be no more worry, hurt, strife, pain, none. For those that come to know him and love him and trust him as the Prince of Peace. So I close out this short time in preparation for our week-long peace rally, letting you know that we are going to be here on the lawn. You'll see us. We're going to be having fun, hoping and praying for opportunities to meet you, to pray with you, perhaps explain some of what we've talked about here this afternoon. But ultimately, we will be praying for the peace of Vermont. We will be praying that the decisions that are made through the representational leadership of your state in the building behind me will be God honoring. We'll be praying that God will arrest the hearts of those that are currently working against him. Our prayer is that we will be salt and light while we're here and that you'll see that when God's people show up, it's not a rally with signs and banners and arguments and debates. It's a people of the light, loving and sharing truth that will set you free. Jesus said that you will come to know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you want to know peace, my friends, it is to be set free by the person and the promise and the power of Jesus the Christ. I pray that you will come to know the peace that is Jesus the Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, I come to you now and I thank you so much for the clarity of your word. I thank you, Lord, that you have left no room for ambiguity and that we can know that if and when others try to create shades of gray, if and when others try to create some form of a false gospel, that we can hold to your word. We can know that you are true. We know that you are ever good and all powerful. And so we come surrendering to victory, embracing your grace, truly repenting and relenting of our sin and cleaving to you, our Christ. I pray, Lord, now as our worship team comes and as we enjoy some time of friends and fellowship, I pray, Lord, that you'll do a work here on the lawn that starts here and does not end ever. Long after we go back to Maryland, I pray that this will be hollowed ground and that what you began here now will never end. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I want to encourage you to get up and have some fun with us. Our worship team is going to come. Some of our family and friends are going to do some sharing after a little bit. Some of us that are just like all of you.